also know uh, know uh, the, the the early and the late Lacan. Correct. And so I think this is very helpful. And I I suppose uh, many of you join uh, me in that feeling that one of the next steps that could have been taken off from the very late Lacan, which is a bit upside down from the early Lacan, and which uh, left over many notions for us to, to, to play with or to reject, is of course the question of the feminine that could not endlessly be uh, related to in terms of that which is not something. And um, perhaps um, even in a sense in our period right now, not only after the Corona crisis, but majorly after the digital media revolution, we, we can uh, conceive even much more to what uh, degree the question of relation or non-relation or what is the non-sexual non relation or what could be another modus of sexuality is so um, needed to help us have more conceptual tools to understand our own relationship in a world which, in which the, the name of the father collapsed. But the, 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 the major collapse, even before the collapse of the name of the father is I believe the collapse of the, the air, the ocean, the rivers, the earth, which were rejected under a certain signature of that which is maternal to be rejected. And so there was a huge, in my view, amalgam between respecting the earth and nationalism or all kind of, you know, we attacked nature and we, uh, in, in similar terms that the, the maternal and the feminine have been either attacked or foreclosed or rejected or left as a split off. So even though I'm not going to concentrate a lot on the feminine in my, perhaps this will be for later on, because I, I, I would like first to put some notions which are Lacanian and which are difficult on the table and move from there, okay? So that's the program and I need one minute to bring my material. Let me do a formal introduction of Braca Ettinger just for uh, folks less familiar with Braca Ettinger's work. Um, I want to uh, share uh, just some brief information about her background and her specialties. So Braca is a psychoanalyst. She's a, a painter uh, and also a Lacanian theoretician. She's a professor at the European Graduate School. Um, her painting and her, her theoretical work has been written about by major philosophers of our time, including Jean-Francois Lyotard, Judith Butler, Brian Masumi, and many others. She is a prominent painter in the French and the Israeli art scenes. She is also a war veteran and remains a committed activist and member in Physicians for Human Rights Israel, where she contributes to the organization as a clinical psychologist and attends Palestinian patients in needed areas in the Palestinian occupied territories. As a theoretician, uh, Braca has developed um, a number of innovative concepts in Lacanian thought, including the matrixial border space and a theory of trans subjectivity um, these uh, theoretical contributions have transformed contemporary debates in art, psychoanalysis, women's studies, and cultural studies. Um, today's seminar is entitled Late Lacan and After, Humanizing Life Drive in the Age of Gaze, Screen Eyes, Symbiosis. So there is a, a little introduction. Do you have your book now? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're very honored to have you, Braca, for uh, this encounter, this seminar, and um, the floor is now yours. Okay, thank you very much. 
and it's really my pleasure. Um, I'll start with a little reminder of the Mabius stri strip, stripe and the sphere, if you could see it, the sphere. And the, even the torus, which is here. which were all kind of ways uh, for Lacan to bring to the fore the relations between the becoming, we can say it now becoming subject at every minute, the becoming subject and the object, whether present, whether loss, if the object is lost or lacking from the beginning, he would call it the object little a, object little a. And if the object is there, subject is not there. We know that these uh, these uh, topographic uh, topological uh, forms shows us surfaces in which, if we move in the surface in the outside, we enter into the inside. We go out again into the outside, and at every moment, there is no possibility to say whether we are inside or outside. And the only possibility can appear when there is some kind of split that enters and cut the topological shape. And at that moment, we can say outside is here, inside is here. Love is here, hate is here, subject is here, object is here. But as long as we are moving along this topological shape, which let, let's take it as a shape in space and time, as we move along in time, in any time of telling the story or listening or connect, connecting to one another, as long as we have not introduced um, a cut or an interpretation or a moment of revelation, it depends how we look at it, there is no way to position to say this is up, this is down. And therefore, perhaps we understand that the intervention is not only uh, pointing into that which is inside and outside, but also creating it. So if in the moment of interpretation, we are creating the, 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 the traces that will belong to us or the traces that will belong to the other or to the world, or imagining ourselves in the world, identify with the world of the subject in treatment and realize what for him, him or her is belong to him or not or lost from him. So we have to bring into account the huge extent and uh, which uh, our, not even counter transference, but our transference to this, the, the subject is um, crucial in the process, which puts us in a certain responsibility, even if we don't work with the transference and counter transference. We recognize it. We don't necessarily work with it. So the, the favorite uh, um, model for, uh, for my analysis that I analyzed um, many times and, and continued is the object of the gaze, the, 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 and the, the relation between eye gaze and screen. But uh, under different uh, topological structures, we can relate to other objects as well. And famously for Lacan, um, um, we will have with the sphere, the oral drive. With the torus, we will have the anal drive, right? With the gaze, uh, we'll go to the Klein bottle and with the voice to the cross cup. But it is not necessarily so well defined because what we have here is an, um, an attempt to, to imagine and to, to represent these unrepresentable uh, notions of the direction, the centrifugal direction or the centripetal direction uh, between object, lost object, 
and subjectivity in becoming. And we can be uh, aware if we follow the topological forms that Lacan chooses that with the oral drive probably he's trying to locate the passage to the, from the outside to the inside without being able to separate them or even seeing how they can reverse themselves. With the anal, we will have this possibility of thinking through the torus over time, a more direction of expulsion from the inside to the outside, which again can turn and turn and change. And then, we, then it gets much more complex with the bottle cl Klein bottle and the cross cup to which I'm going to refer to in a more specific way. So I will also present um, through that um, the question of what I called uh, matrixial uh, object A, matrixial link, matrixial border linking and border spacing. And especially if we have time, uh, border swerving, which is very important in order to understand the relation to, of the subject to trauma. So in a more general way, the object A index, indexes absence of contact with the psychic originary thing, resulting from an incision from the other, the other with the big O as body, or as the body of the mother, and I'm saying it quite immediately also, the mother M slash big O the archaic mother other, which um, evades the structures the moment a subjectivity uh, is established. And gender the subject along the small number of unconscious dimension, vision is privileged among them. As a leftover of the activity of the scopic drive in the real, the object A is cleft from the subject as well as from the other, other. At the same time, the object is missing in me and missing in you. It is not uh, just in the missing in the out inside, but it is also missing for the outside in which, to which I am relating. And it has no direct representation in the image. This is why Lacan needs topological, uh, topological uh, figures. The split object A in the field of vision is the gaze, of course, G-A-Z-E. It is a remnant of the trajectory of the scopic drive, trying to reach for its objects, and in fact, of the object trying to reach me. It is a leftover of inaccessible bodily sampling of my corporeality and of the other. For Lacan, this gaze split from both the subject and the other is a priori an absence and on the level of the real, it's a libidinal loss. So, um, what I will call a matrixial object A uh, is, uh, assumes that impossibility of total loss, the impossibility of a total other, if we are to humanize the human subject, then the point of, uh, the point upon which we are establishing our a basic assumption in psychoanalysis have to be examined. We have to examine this drive, which I hope to do today a little. We have to examine life drive even more than death drive in Freud to see how it all began. And we, we have also to, to put doubt in the basic structuring of subjectivity that established by Freud, continued by Lacan, in which the I establishes itself through the rejection of that which is not I. This is a Freudian definition. 
and Lacan follows on that. It is as if whatever it is that gives us um, a feeling of being or becoming uh, is always connected to that move of uh, splitting and re a rejective split in the matrixial sphere and talking about the feminine and relating it to the maternal and uh, our own being in separating in jointness from the archaic maternal figure and from the other at any moment, this kind of movement. The, therefore, the model is not the newness of birth, which is then rejecting and accumulating leftovers, but rather it, the, the beginning of the subject have never been a new and totally uh, either symbiotic or totally separated or even not aspiring to total separation um, I or subjectivity. So the matrixial object A, that sometimes I called it link A, and as I developed the theory, I, I, I uh, followed this movement of border linking and border spacing of this relationship between subject and object is a trail of separation in jointness. The incision is not possible. The incision from the archaic maternal in us is not possible. And castration in the sense of uh, even uh, early Lacan and also late Lacan is, uh, is not the modus through which we can establish a subject, uh, our self as subject that takes into account the feminine. So it is not a trace of a lost object, but a link that ebbs and flows with the co-emergence and co-fading of connected, connected I and non-I. Now, what is the nature of this connectedness? I do not talk about intersubjectivity. So the way we define subject then enters intersubjectivity. I'm talking about transjectivity and transsubjectivity and the way this dimension enters subjectivity and the, and the definition of the other. So the matrixial sphere is a space of encounters and their trails. Traces of my traumatic encounters with my non-I uh, occurring along unconscious pathways opened by originary encounter event. So here's another passage I'm doing. Instead of thinking about thing that then is transformed into object, or even lacking object, the passage from thing to object, I say, no, right from the beginning, we can call the primordial event an encounter event. And therefore the passage would not be from thing to object, but from encounter event, which is an archaic modus into different kinds of encounter event. And psychoanalysis uh, and the relation with the patient is for me an encounter event in the sense that it is uh, also takes, uh, takes place in time. Not every encounter is an encounter event and not every event becomes so meaningful and so transformative in potential. When there is the transformative potentiality there is an encounter event which plays with time. One of the things that I hope to do in this, uh, in our seminar is also talk about time and the way how we appreciate future enters the, the, the field of interpretation of what we are doing, what we are doing uh, with one another at every moment every therapeutic moment but every moment in general and what is the, the position of the, what is, how can we 
refigure the future time in the, in the process, in the analytical process. So I'm talking about an originary uh, thing encounter, thing event, or finally encounter event. And the way that traces of encounter eventing are working within us, with us, within us, with us, with others, in a way for which uh, any notion of uh, definite castration and total other doesn't work. And therefore it is not, uh, the matrixial is not on the side of the feminine and not all uh, non-relations, but is beyond, it's a, the feminine which is beyond the four positions of sexu sexuality that Lacan offers. It's, we shift the paradigm, we go, we move forward from it. And the, the, for me, the, you know, the, the, one of the topological form, which is always uh, with me and I work with it a lot, is the, the double conch, conch? How do you call it? The conch, the, this one. I, you can start to follow from here and it will go there where, you, where we don't know, but you can start, for example, from here and see what goes on if you work like this and enter from here and come from there and imagine, I prepared for you, I might bring them later, all these um, conch, when they are trans connecting. Now, why this, why this uh, topology of the, of the seashell is so interesting? It is because we can imagine, we can imagine that we, when we put them next to one another, what will be connecting is not interconnection, but transconnection in the sense that a, you know, the resonance of the one will influence the resonance in the other, that whatever, uh, if I pass the air through it, the way the air passed through it can pass through the other, yes or no. And, uh, and what is important in, in that is that the, um, in the matrixial, we, can, we do not imagine um, a form which is one, which is only one. Ilia de Lang, we did not talk about it. We will not talk about it today, but there is the one, the subject and its oneness is, um, is problematic. So, um, let me uh, present to you some, uh, something more when we talk about the, the topological forms in uh, Lacan, the Tauros, the, the Klein bottle, the, uh, the cross cup, yeah? We, we, we know that we have a shape and what Lacan is doing with this shape, he relates to the edge of the shape. For example, a cross cup is like this. And then to the possibility that each point can relate to another point and then you can start to fold them. And if you fold them, this point here now is close to this one. Like this, they were separate. So the forms are in fact, uh, he relates to in order to show that at each point, a point from the imaginary can touch the symbolic in this way or in that way, or the symbolic can define uh, that which will be excluded as real in this way and that way, etc. There are different ways, but in the end, it is all about how the subject constructs itself vis-a-vis -vis the fantasy. The object A belongs to the fantasy. So what are we talking about um, when we say that these kind of shapes gets their final um, definitive moment when there is an interpretation or a cut, 
and they become flat, flattened like a disc. And then we can, we can identify inside, outside and, and so on. Um, one of the things that I um, try to put into our uh, understanding is the major difference between the articulation of the primal scene and the Oedipus complex. And in fact, one of the things that occurs in the transformation is a way to, to, come, to come from our position, which is already Oedipal. Guess what is the position of the primal scene? or take from the primal scene and do some intervention in which we discover other uh, formats and other um, positioning of the subject vis-a-vis -vis its fantasy. And uh, the crucial thing is that the, in, the Oedipal, in, the, in the most symbolic way, in the Oedipal positioning, it is possible to imagine this subject, that subject, the paternal subject, the maternal subject, me, them, objects, and I, uh, in this formula of castration, I become when I, dis when I succeed to put them off. This structures the primal scene, which was before, as symbiosis. But is it symbiotic? With the question of the with the matrix, and we can show that he, it had never been symbiotic. Now, the structure of the subject in this primal scene entails the recognition that if that I cannot totally reject the maternal, the paternal, in order to become, because I would not come, I would not have been born. It's retroactive, right? I would not have been born if I am rejecting this kind of a formula in which this jointness was necessity for life. So to, to imagine the subject starting with a kind of either autistic positioning or symbiotic positioning, then establishing itself through castration is already a denial of the importance of the primal scene, whatever it is. Because this is the question I endlessly will ask myself, how come that I have come to this life? With the matrix, the importance for me is um, on the imaginary level is, is pregnancy. So that we realize that on very many different level, also kinesthesia, also proper proprioception, I don't know how to say it in English. The, 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 the moment I, I uh, realize whatever it is that can become a part of my subjectivity, I am already transconnected through all kind of vibrations and resonance. I'm not alone um, and I'm not aspiring to this total uh, cut. So um, I'm going to, to read uh, slowly, um, uh, at least that we have one example of how the, how the topological um, form serve the Lacanian thinking. And from that, we can think also about other topological forms. Lacan explains the relations in fantasy of the subject to the object A in terms of topological surfaces such as flattenable disc, disc apletisable, I, I translated like that, I don't know how to translate it, and the Mobius stripe in all the shapes that we showed, which combine, they combine to form a cross cup. The cross cup is particularly interesting. You know, it is structured from the, it's a development of how, when you put a bottle climb together, it doesn't matter the mathematics of it. And we don't need geometry 
it doesn't matter so much. What we need to understand is that there is a continuity between subject and object that appear uh, at a certain moment uh, as uh, at a certain moment, we can realize one side or the other only if we performed a cut on the shape. That's the major point. These topological surfaces are analog analogous, for example, and uh, here I put it uh, in the domain of the gaze, to the gaze, which is the object, right? The subject and the projective plan the projective plan, think of it as a screen, think of it as an internal screen of dreaming, and uh, you can also think of it as painting. For me, the most uh, easy uh, metaphor is, is painting, but also other forms of art. Just as the properties of each of these surfaces can only be perceived from another dimension, this is why it needs to be projected on another plan if we want to perceive it. Psychological functions analogous to them can only be envisioned after a phallic cut has been made in a global, and I quote, undifferentiated fabric. So this, that which is before the symbiosis is imagined as undifferentiated and undifferentiable. It's like uh, Esther Beek in the British tradition. It has a lot of parallels in the thinking of, uh, of uh, Bion and of other analysts. Uh, so there is a cut in the undifferentiated fabric, which transforms it into a cross cap. It have not been before that moment, this topological shape projected. This fabric, Lacan calls it sometimes bubble, is the other, the imagination of the other. And uh, what I call other as woman or body situated in that location of the archaic mother, M slash big O. So it's not the other of the chains of the signifiers. It's not the symbolic other, but is a reference to an ar archaic other encounter eventing, which had, from which we had to differentiate ourselves and become different but keeping the same path, path for transconnecting to others just as well on the partial level, not on the level of full subject standing in front of another full subject, but on that level where limits are crossed and where trauma can occur, but also therapeutic transformation can occur. The bubble, okay, or this undifferentiated fabric, where what we what where what we later become the subject is intermingled then to begin with with the archaic other. To begin with, the future subject is immersed in the other big O in fusion with her, of necessity her. It's perhaps the only, the only um, moment we can, where we can talk about her without relating to gender. It's not gender. It's not the her of gender. It's not, uh, it is the, um, this body as it is transconnected to us inseparable from my perception of whatever I can see as I. Even though there is an inside and an outside of the bubble, it is not possible to orient by them and to distinguish reality from desire. What are primitively flip sides in the location of the other, says Lacan, plays heads or tails, 
like the two sides of a coin. However, there is no way concerns the subject. There is no way uh, a concern for the subject because for Lacan, there is not yet a subject. The subject begins with the cut. This is what Lacan tells us. So what we see here as the object little a and what we see here as the topological form transform themselves into our positioning vis-a-vis -vis the phantasmatic uh, objects. A cut out eliminated substance establishing a total change in the structure of the bubble. This is the object A. And it's important here because if I say the object and object A already comes from a thing, then it has been produced through that structure of the cut. The cut is necessary for that. We will receive something else if we will have another procedure of interfe in interference or of engaging. The moment that the object A, the gaze or the voice, the voice is a very, very interesting uh, object. Um, I dedicated to it some, some papers in the past. It's very interesting. The object A is cut out and falls away from the fabric. We have a bubble, a fabric, undifferentiated. The surface itself is transformed. That's the point. When you cut the mo any Mobius uh, stripe or any Mobius shape, this, the surface is transformed. It is not anymore the surface of that top topology. Its properties as cross cap are revealed while what remains becomes a flattenable disc with distinct flip sides, a recto and a verso or a right side up and an underside, so that it is no longer possible to pass from one to the other without crossing or leaping over an edge, which is something which is not possible. And that, that Lacan puts it like that, the edge created by subtracting the object A. This objet étranger, this strange object, is precisely what makes such a leap impossible. So um, I would like now to jump a little and to talk about the difference. And also for us, when we listen to our patients, we have to identify when, not only when we are on a, um, we, we are hoover, hoovering around a structure where there is more uh, definitions, it's more edible, let's say, and not only pre-edible, but the primal screen, which is, which is not the pre-edible, which is prior to anything that I have been connected to, but is meaningful to my becoming human. Um, I want to to ask you, all of all of you, but especially Daniel, if you'd like me to go a little more deep into the topological structure and explain a bit more Lacan. Or would you like uh, to move on into more um, into my own um, recent work on the death drive and life drive and um, sure um, um, because of course we can go very deep but I can also send for all those who wishes I can send the the papers I'm reading from the, you can take it from my computer and um, uh, to see how it is built, you know, very slowly. Mm -hmm. 
in order to explain the relations between the eye, eye mm -hmm. and the gaze, mm -hmm. and the eye and the non-eye, subject and object, and so on. All, all this is a very, very slow work in the um, in a certain um, or we can move on a bit to the situation so, now hmm. um, we... and how uh, how anymore we cannot anymore talk about eye gaze and screen because now the symbiosis is eye screen gaze hmm. which includes us it's 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 like a fractal the eye versus the screen gaze and myself working on the path using exploiting i would even say our libidinal structures exploiting our narcissism and how to to make um, the difference between uh, the screens that we have now to deal with, the object that we have now to deal with. And uh, so there is inside my head the competition between continuing with Lacan or moving so we to have the material a, gaze. We, okay, I think, we, I think we would like to proceed more on your, your work, not, okay. not Lacan as much, but if you are going to join us um, next week, we have we have more time. So, however you feel appropriate, I'm I'm thinking also the two are very related. So I know there are questions even now based on what you've already presented. So would mm -hmm. you would you like um, a couple questions now and then then you can go? Is that okay? Or would it's you like really... to hold questions? I think I should give some more material first. Okay. I think I should give some more material, uh, and if the ans the questions were not answered, <laughs> yeah, by what I'm going yeah. to give. Very good. This so I think was more uh, fast. Hmm? everyone everyone seems to think that we should continue to talk about gaze and screen right. now, and then we can right. loop back to the Lacanian. Um, questions uh, when it's appropriate. Okay, okay, this, that's all right. Um, I'm going to also to, to relate it to the feminine. This is going to be useful. In Lacan's teaching in the 70s, as we all know, the topological sphere joins the feminine as real, as inaccessible to knowledge, clearly pointing to woman beyond the phallus. Lacan did not uh, abdicate the kingdom of the phallus until the end of his teaching, even though he tried. From this perspective, the woman and her sexual relation will always remain an impossible other. It is the spheric, I'm, I'm quoting, it is the spheric topology of this object called A projected on the heterogeneous other of the composite that the co cross cap constitutes, okay? So now I'm going to, to, to if I'm going to, to move to the question of the, gaze and the eye and the screen in the matrixial. I will uh, further talk a, a little about that planar sphere. Um, the matrixial unconscious sphere is, I call it a border space of simultaneous co-emergence and co-fading of the eye with the non-I, which is not yet cognized. So we can talk in, partial, uh, in terms of partial subjectivity. We can talk about moments. We can talk about links to the fragmented me and su partial subject, par partial object. But what is not possible, like in the pregnancy metaphor, is 
fusion and symbiosis, and what is not possible is a total rejection. This composite produces share and transmit, therefore, joint, but also diffracted and also hybrid object of gaze, okay? So we have to think about the link as conductible, like resonance between I and non-I. Um, I'm talking I, about this kind of intimate sharing um, and not uh, fusing where differentiation doesn't happen with the cut, but it happens through attunement of distance in proximity of and continual reattunement. And for that, uh, I elaborated a group of, uh, of mechanisms that I realize happen in these impossible relations and we, where metonymic or metaphor do not hold, cannot account for. So it needs, it's another group. For the moment, let's call them metamorphosis. We cannot uh, have time to get into that. So we are negotiating relations without relating on the borders of appearance and disappearance on the borders of subject and object, and also among subject and partial subjects, and to create a language that we can share. Uh, when I talk about the resonance between subject object, I call that resonance linking sphere, I talk about transjectivity, transjects, transjectivity, which is not inter. And when I talk with about subject subject and partial subjectivities i talk about the trans subjectivity because um, i make the difference as you see between whatever it is we that we can relate to as object and whatever it is that can we can relate to as subject and there is a certain claim that not everything that we define as non i can enter the category of object or can become an object. That this is a mistake in the perspective, or this is only one perspective. And there are other perspectives as well. Especially if you want to think about the possibility of um, creativity and art and the difference between creativity and art. The creativity, um, is a domain which does not uh, need necessarily to assume uh, ethics. Artworking is not aesthetics, is not pure creativity. Art working occurs between ethics and aesthetics. Okay, so it's not about creativity, it's not just co emergence. We have to realize the relations that occurred bef um, in our way to become a subject and also retroactively through the, the primal scene as a kind of incest that is not sexual and that cannot be avoided. Body to body coming together cannot be avoided, but is not to be you know, put aside as sexual because it's not. There are other kinds of relations that are not, uh, cannot be considered sexual, and yet they are, trans they are transgressive. And our trans connectivity is transgressive. And uh, that's one of the points, how to realize this transgression that occurs all the time and transform them into creativity and not into traumatic uh, event and not put them in the basket of uh, sexuality. Um, therefore, uh, few categories cannot uh, serve in the way we know them and majorly 
um, we cannot uh, preserve the, the, the category of uh, for the feminine, for the feminine. We cannot preserve, for example, the category of perversion as such, because it demands a certain definition of an object and then a certain transgression, which is very different from the transgression I'm talking about. Um, let's go to the gay to uh, more deep to the to the gaze to the question of, uh, of um, oops There's a lot of homework, you see, and I cannot find my, cannot find myself. Okay. Um, So we will take it from another point of view. I want to read to you a little passage that I wrote about Narcissus of Caravaggio. Do you know the painting Narcissus Narciss of Caravaggio? Um, this is Caravaggio looking at himself in the water, looking for its reflection and uh, in the reflection, we don't see anymore this beautiful young man, but we see old person. And um, would you, Rocco, would you like me to share the, the image? I can, you share can it. yes, this okay. will be fantastic. Give yes. me, give me just one moment. Okay. That's it. Great. Leave it on the screen. So death, in my view, death is what in Caravaggio's Narcissus, searching loving gaze through its own image in the water mirror finds. Death does not reflect Narcissus lasting eyes but rather gazes at him. And we know that in the definition of Lacan, it is the gaze that looks at us and forms us as that which is lost from us. Here, well before the era of Freud's unconscious uncanny, not Eros impels the self-lover eyes, but Thanatos. Death drive supplies the psychic energy for the veiled spell of death. For Freud, the projection of an impulse to gaze, repressed under aggressive tendencies, induces the double as a, pre, a persecutory imaginary instance, source of anxiety. Caravaggio's Narcissus, autoerotic kneeling before oneself, renders a spectral image of decay. Intuitively and logically, this figure is perceived as Narcissus after image. Yet in my view, it rather absorbs and returns the painter's for image, the unconscious carrier of his vision, his invisible subject matter. A visual sign 
that symbolizes afterlife appears when my eyes follow the trajectory of Narcissus transformation of the knee, look at his knee. This potent phallic symbol, central source of enigmatic luminosity in the painting into a memento mori mark form, hinting that the lasting gaze of Thanatos looks from the paintings unconscious, retroactively says through a future painting of Caravaggio as well, San Girolamo, where replica of this blurred color form you come transmutes into a skull. Beauty in Narcissus in the painting is the phantasmatic screen that hides the gaze that asks us to remember our human mortality. For Freud, repetition is a major manifestation of death drive. It testified to its activation. If psychic narcissistic gaze is a result of prim primary separation from the archaic mother, M slash big O, repressed according to trajectories of castration and anxiety, the eye of Narcissus and the gaze he longs for remain forever split. And this gaze can only appear accompanied by sheer anxiety in the form of the double, dusk of a self aggressively projected into rejected otherness, split to avoid symbiosis with the mother conceived as death and self annihilation where grave and womb are fused through the lenses of historically transmitted cultural confusion. Uncanny anxiety aroused by art opens an interval from such sheer anxiety. With Caravaggio, we see that before the modern conception of narcissism um, that we know from Freud, one can only love itself or one can only love the one who protects the self or one can only love its ego ideal, etc. The concept of subject as a being towards death, like Heidegger, and beauty as a barrage from death, like Lacan, a similar crystallization of subject here appears in a nutshell, along a masculine cultural affiliation that reflects father-son internalized relation. In contemporary terms, Caravaggio unveils fascination as a deadening freeze, what for Lacan, what Lacan called fascinum, the gaze that freezes, that catches us and freezes life, the kill that kills us. The narcissistic wound of the figure is transparent, but its ideal and the failure of this ideal is visible. It condemns the subject to isolation during self-abandonment to autoerotic longing. And we can think about Lacan and his talks about the, the, um, the jouissance of the one and how autistic it is and how it on, it, there is no relation. To use Lacanian terms now to address psychic life, the gaze directed from the object of the gaze to the subject, to its eyes, is projected on a phantasmatic internal screen. This internal screen of fantasy can, up to an extent, be compared to an exterior screen, the film, the video, the digital screens, taken as metaphors for the relations between passion and desire. Eye and gaze can never meet except on a phantasmatic screen. If they meet in the real, this will happen through a psychotic undifferentiation in the form of hallucination, symbiotic fusion, where the self appears uh, and parano um, in a paranoidical uh, delusion. Um, I will move now to... Um, the, the idea, I will briefly say, that certain social digital uh, media, not like Zoom in my view, because it has another function, 
but like uh, Facebook and Instagram and the like, uh, there is a fusion that is offered to the subject and is actualized through the subject. And I refer to it as digital stupor to the cumulative effect of digital social media and digital games and not to the question of the virtual uh, as such. Now, what, what is the digital stupor rather than anxiety? It's not anxiety. It means stupefaction, state of senselessness, amazement, uh, unconscious torpor and insensibility, some kind of coma. Dig digital stupor is the result of overwhelmedness and inundation of accumulative instance of inundation in the endless plasticity and endless multiplication of the screens. So there is um, a moment which is the symbiosis, eye gaze and screen, which is uh, addictive and which takes the form which exploits the form, which drives on the forms that we all know of the relations between subject and fantasy and the, the lanes, the path of narcissistic uh, desire. So we can speak of a stupor and not as trauma because of the kind of time it engages. And since the phenomenon here is of obsession with immediate jouissance which like in the painting of Caravaggio, this obsession uh, give rise to death drive. Um, to that, uh, we can talk then about a fused gaze screen in symbiosis with a psychic eye that avoids, that empties desire. So we can see that the idea that we cannot move on anymore with the idea that if we, we take some, um, some symbiotic situation and we produce a cut in it, we can transform something. The di digital screen, for example, fused with the qualities of an unconscious gaze that joins our phantasmatic threads become a subjective aging agency, an eye gaze screen that controls the subject who becomes its object, that is us. In a digital stupor, and even contrary to the classical uh, Caravaggio, narcissism and death drive manifest themselves together in the passing out of the humanized past and the crumbling of the humanized future. Um, Emma, now I'll, I'll present a little the matrixial uh, possibility, uh, which can be also serve as a resistance. Matrixial non-symbiotic gaze, gaze within screen, non-symbiotic eye gaze screen but gaze within screen we'll talk about it this is an idea that i wrote about in 1996 and all these uh, media we're talking about did not exist yet we hardly had a mobile telephone by then um, i'll just say a few words about the possibility of the gaze and screen then we move to question okay it's okay so non-symbiotic gaze within screen can differentiate itself by awareness, becoming aware to the deadening affective numbness that accompanies the fusion between the eye, the phantasmatic screen gaze and the real virtual screen gaze. I'll explain. The phallic web of web, webs uses and can in principle abuse our primordial matrixiality. So I think there is a need to understand the matrixial beyond the phallus so that we become aware of it and we will not 
allow the this big screen other uh, play with us on our own ignorance and knowledge. Abuses our primordial matrixiality, our capacity for self relinquishment and concern, and even compassion. The awareness to the matrixial then to our affective trans subjectivity and transjectivity that enables our alliances can become a way of resistance. Um, in a matrixial non-symbiotic differentiation of that which is I and non-I, the I, the screen, the gaze, the human freedom even can appear like that. It's a freedom rift, which cannot be tied to the entirely new or to the entirely newness imaginary of a newborn. Um, the, um, I'd like to say something about the, the gaze again and finish with that for the moment. And if we have time, we will say more. Um, and a, a very early definition that I gave to that uh, possibility of um, matrixial differentiation, I said that the phallic gaze, its definition, excites us while threatening to annihilate us in its emergence on the screen. The symbiotic gaze invites us to sink inside it while threatening to annihilate us together with the screen. So both of them cannot serve for us. The matrixial gaze thrills us while making us aware that we are participating in a drama which is wider. Our subjectivity is a drama which is wider than our own individual self. I can have eyes and not see, have ears and not hear. The gaze can see you without eyes. I can look at you without seeing you. This is the situation of the, of the gaze screen right now. Gaze, look and seeing are different notions. Seeing, listening involves senses coordinated with affects on the one hand and ideas on the other hand. So, um, since we don't have a lot of time and I want to take question and then maybe return or decide where we take the discussion, whether we take it to the gaze and screen or to the feminine matrixial or to, then, um, I will say one thing, which is very important, I think, that uh, when we move from Freud to Lacan and to the matrixial, there is one major change, which is, which is the understanding not of death drive, but of life drive. When we read Freud and also Lacan and also Deleuze and Guattari, we see that there is a major acceptance of a certain idea of life drive, which is patterned upon the life drive of a unicell or amoeba. Or um, Lacan has a wonderful passage that I uh, analyzed where, where in fact this object A is a kind of a friction of a life drive, right? This is when he starts to balance back the, the theory and try to formulate the object A from the real towards the symbolic and not the other way around, not as a lack, but as a, as a um, entity. He gets it upon the path of life drive and life drive is this uh, uh, amoeba and this unicell splitting themselves, this element in us which moves from person for, to person and lives forever and represent immortality. In the contemporary language, it will be the genes, the DNA, the DNA. 
So this, we are the, the objects of this life drive that uses us in order to continue forever and ever over the generations. And when we look at it in details, we realize that nothing from that definition of life drive takes into account the, the humanizing life on earth. And so therefore the, the, we, we get a, in all the different theories, we get death drive that motivates us. And uh, when, when it is a life drive, it remains in the service of our uh, DNA's uh, structures. And this is very important if we want to re rethink human subject in terms of the feminine and the matricial and the maternal, then in bringing into account the pregnancy, the fact that we are co-emerging in psychic terms, and that this is a dimension all along and between life, between we are born and we, we die, then we are dealing with uh, addition also, a transformation to the idea of life drive, which already accompanies us for almost 130, 40 years, we can do some step forward. I can stop here and take questions. Thank you so much. Um, this has been such a pleasure to, to, to hear you develop these threads. Um, I. Uh, I don't want to, um, I have questions myself, but we also have questions from the chat. Um, and again, since I think so many of us are very engaged with, with this uh, presentation, it's probably best that you raise your hand. I think by now you know how to do that. You, you click on the uh, reactions tab down below, and then you press hand. Um, why don't we, yes, why don't we start with Wilfred who has a question on the, the Lacanian notion of mirror stage and some of the earlier okay. comments that you made. Okay, go ahead. Sure. So could one not say that one of the very early theories of Lacan, the mirror stage gave to the gaze, but he didn't call it a gaze, but to the gaze, the crucial function of the baby to realize that the body parts belong to a unified body. Absolutely. Of course, the, the, the mirror stage was a very crucial in terms of uh, the, 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 the drive, the scopic drive that through the mirror, I mean, my feeling of myself is of necessity partial and, uh, and mixed, and I cannot have an idea that all these feelings and emotions and affects and events, they are all belong to one entity, which becomes the subject. And for the early Lacan, it is the, the moment, it's also the moment uh, in development. It's not only in a structure but a, a developmental moment where I could see that I am this, I have these limits and so on. So the, the gaze is, uh, the early gaze in the early Lacan is a structuring uh, formula which, uh, which allows these uh, parts of me to put themselves together. Uh, but um, as time goes on, we can see it also um, as a metaphor. Um, and also what we saw with this, the um, four concept of psychoanalysis in 64, we see some, a, a very important new stage. So when I say as a metaphor, we can also say that the regard, the look of the outside into me, the reflection that the outside gives to me structures me just as well collecting my bits and parts into that entity that is then 
defined not only through the mirror, but the mother as a mirror, the father as a mirror, the environment as, an, as a mirror. So the metaphor, the, the, the mirror stages, it's also a, a metaphorical understanding that from the outside will come whatever it is that will calm me and collect me together. But then in 64, uh, Lacan emits uh, new um, problems. And especially what we see is the, the importance of the lack of that which is not becomes more and more and more important. So it's not only that the reflection in the mirror is not a real me, it's, it's a virtual me ref uh, reflected. It is also that what structures me is that which disappears. If we take it historically with Melanie Klein, the object that defines me and shapes me and contributes me as a subject is the present object, the good breast, the bread, you know, the good breast participate in the story. When we go to Bion, and I think that Bion influenced Lacan, I, I um, remarked it uh, in different places. The object becomes when it disappears. So meaning, the meaning of the good breast is not when the breast is here, but when it is no longer here. Here we, we have the echo of loss and loss is still developmental, it happens in time. So when, when Lacan wants to move not to, to emphasize not development, but structure, he does not talk about loss anymore. The object is not that which we lose. The object is lacking from the beginning by definition. So what is the real in the early Lacan in the period we talk about? Anything that the symbolic cannot reflect to us, cannot capture for us, cannot interpret. The, it, therefore, the lack is in the structure. And lack and loss are not the same thing. The, the thing could, be, uh, could have been always lost when the subject appears. So the subject has no way to address that. And this is why I said there is a development in Lacan, which is very important. It's important to see what period we read <clears throat> because <clears throat> in the very late Lacan, he's trying to say <clears throat> that the object, that the real is not only that which is lacking, but also that kind of present jouissance for which uh, we cannot give any words and no definition can capture it. And so you see this, there is this movement in the <clears throat> definition of the gaze and its um, place in <clears throat> becoming a subject. Very good. Next we have Andrew, please. Oh, um, first of all, thank you so much. This is really very um, illuminating and, and very fascinating. You opened a lot of different areas, um, particularly I really found the section that you closed on the stupor of the screen digital world today, fascinating area that we could just discuss in itself. And I. But I'd like to go a little bit back earlier to some of the subjects that you opened up um, where you were talking about, let me see if I can get back to this, um, the structure of how fantasy works uh, with, with subjectivity. And you, you, if I may say, I wanna give a little more, I'm gonna just get right to the point, what the role of essentially the, the phallus is in, in the way you're theorizing here. And what I mean by that is by way of talking about um, Lacan's seminar, which is translated in English to or worse. It's called or worse. And there's a, there's a wonderful passage in it. Oh, where he's, yeah, he's describing a scene, an everyday situation 
whereby people walk around the streets and they encounter different people and they go to a store and buy a croissant or whatever. And it's all just a kind of flow of interactions and signifiers and it's all a kind of confusion of interactions and everything's just a kind of confusion, essentially. You don't know what's going on. And the only point in which you feel something between people is in, at bottom, a negotiation of where is the phallus. What really is happening between people comes down to something, not that you're gonna have sex with the person, but something of a question of a flirtatious moment, something of, at bottom, something of a moment of a question of where is the phallus. At, at, I'm being a little crude right now, it doesn't necessarily come down to sexuality. It could come down to all kinds of negotiations of meaning. So that could be something like you're in a hospital, for God forbid that doesn't happen to anyone here, but you do make choices of which nurse or doctor you prefer because there's a certain, as you said, humanist element of meaning between you and the other where you are in fact negotiating a certain interaction of meaning around words and interaction of change that does have something to do with, I'll call it the phallus of signifying what's important. So where I'm questioning here is that you, you in your exposition have described castration as total annihilation, as more or less total castration. And what I'm trying to understand is what the role in sort of the, the, the period we're in now where we could generally describe as decline of the, the paternal you know, order, is it really, we're seeing a situation where it's, it's adequate to describe certainly generally um, a period of the, not all of the emergence of the of different ways of articulating the feminine sexuality, et cetera, or uh, et cetera. But is it, 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 how do we describe or articulate the role of essentially the, the phallus in a certain sense within this horizon and, and, in, and in effect within the clinical um, situation or indeed in how we describe or discuss um, cultural or political phenomena. Indeed, when you were descri describing, for example, the stupor of the you know, political atmosphere of um, the media world, et cetera. So it, it just enters into a lot of different situations that, that I, I just wanted to open up that discussion. That's all, really. And I'd see if you could explore that a little bit further. Okay. This is a Fantastic question, because it's very important to say right from the beginning that the phallus is not the penis. No, sure. Absolutely. For Lacan and for, the, for Lacan, there is, uh, we can say that the, 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 the structure, the phallic structure has a certain privilege when you are male, because it might correspond to a certain, well, for many, many reasons, but that's not the point. We, we know the famous formula where he say that, that the imaginary phallus, each one of us must lose. Um, we can joke about it and say that it's more difficult to lose what you don't, you imagine you have than what you imagine you don't have. But in any case, from the beginning, for Lacan, the phallus is symbolic and the phallus is imaginary as well. And uh, it's, we are not talking about body and we are not even talking about sexuality. But there is a difference between Lacan in Upir, which is a very late seminar, quite a late seminar, and Lacan in the beginning, because in the beginning, well, the, where, where, when he starts, the location of the phallus is indeed, uh, the, the important location is in the symbolic, and it refers to, to meaning, even to linguistic meaning. It refers to interpretation. It refers to how we um, 
how language is used in order to, to reorganize, yeah, instead of the mirror, to reorganize our experiences and so on. And then therefore this, a certain amount of organization, which he calls the phallus, must be um, present at every stage. When I talk about other processes, or when I talk about metamorphosis, I'm not replacing metaphor and I'm not replacing metonymy and the matrixial does not replace the phallus. It's a, it's a, a, a word which is uh, here to describe a field with its concepts. Now, castration and the phallus is not the same. Castration is the mechanism that is used in order to organize in a phallic way, which means that it takes us to the field of meaning and, and how meaning is indeed uh, reaches us. Now, we might say that meaning can be created in this all kind of different way, but for Lacan, it's very specific. Now, what is so amazing when you read Lacan, you see how first the phallus is there in the symbolic and the imaginary phallus, it doesn't matter. You know, the, the way you identify yourself as man or woman in relation to the phallus, it doesn't matter. Even later on, we all have then relation to the phallus as woman, as man, as uh, avoiding it, uh, rejecting it, accepting it, melting with it, and so on. But, uh, but what is so amazing is how we, without us uh, realizing it, we move from seminar to seminar, the phallus starts to occupy just any place of sense possible. So first it occupies the meaning that is, and that which is not escapes it as an object. And then it also starts to occupy that which is not. Then we have the minus phi. Then it starts to occupy every moment. In my writing, I make the difference between um, um, when I talk about uh, sense and meaning becomes very important in my formulation and how to move from sense to meaning is very important and not only from meaning into the rest of it because if the phallus defines the meaning it doesn't define male or masculine sure mm -hmm. it, if it says that whenever we want to understand we are in the hands of that structure and phallus the castration is its preferable mechanism so what what, for, for what Lacan is doing. He says, I don't care how you call it. What you might put a ping pong ball instead of the oral or the anal or the breast or, or the penis or whatever you want. Whenever you use the castration mechanism, you produce a phallic uh, meaning. Indeed. Therefore, I'm not fighting the phallic meaning. I'm saying this kind of meaning attribution and this kind of mechanism that, that works through rejection is uh, blind to other kinds of mechanism of sense making and sense giving mm. in that universe. And the, the, it's not about rejecting the phallic or castration, it's about other ways of making sense and giving sense. And when we say that, when, when Lacan says that when I'm already walking in the, he does not mean who has the power. Phallus also became equivalent with power, which is, and he doesn't necessarily, of course, doesn't mean who flirts with whom. He means what What's, what thread will I pull in order to give meaning to what to this, to this uh, balagan we say in Hebrew, to this total confusion over a, ba a band overwhelming set of information. I'm going to go this way or that way, and I'll give meaning through whatever is already in the structure, of course, of my own fantasy of what the other is, what the object is and how I can relate. So 
what is the me and you? Is the other not me or is it a non-I which is not rejected from the I? This is what I'm trying to drive at because I feel like there's something of an impasse here at this point, theoretically, because indeed, I don't know that the, let's say if we're talking about the stupor of the media world, if you're a QAnon person, let's just hypothetically imagine we're QAnon people and we're taking in all the media, every possible thing that comes in on the media, all conspiracy theories out there, and we absorb every single one and we wanna flow with every fantasy possibly out there that will not resolve the problem of understanding what knowledge to identify with. We will just be some psychotic space then. We might have some fantasy with it that we're identifying with it, but we're not anywhere located any more than we were before in some 1955 fantasy that we're a solid man or a good girl. There's no, there's no solution that way through an illusion of some oneness with all the so exactly so what 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 you say is also well this paper on the stupor of course is long and i can send it in or that this theory um is not sufficient even lacan of the of the 70s could not imagine and the structure of subjectivity that he offered could not uh, suffice, suff be enough for what we experience. When I started to write the matrixial sphere, it's not the film matrix, it, 10 years before I, I wrote a theory uh, and a book on the matrix, um, it was already to, uh, to explain what kind of webs we can create, which which should which would be still uh, uh, keeping the, the affect and another kind of meaning and so on, and how it is related to, to after, after the, mm. the feminine in Lacan. And um, in order to, to give other possibilities, other maps to read uh, into a universe, which in a sense is more and more actualized now, and I mm. talked about the web of webs, there was no web. We didn't mm. have internet, but it was already clear to me, what are the lacuna? What are the lacunes in the theory, both Lacan and, and, and Freud? And that uh, how we move forward and moving forward doesn't mean we are throwing away everything before, or we, we cannot even throw not the paternal and maternal and the the, and not even the phallus, but we have to understand that it changed shapes. Mm. And up until the end, in the writing of Lacan, I picked, I went over all of that. He's still nominating every possibility of meaning under the wings of phallus castration and, and all of that, even when he talks about the continuity of one another and the topological forms and so on. We can talk on a, on another occasion on this uh, the plates in the, the these forms like this you know in the writing of Lacan which are later than the topological and how we can transform that into go beyond that to to explain contemporary subjectivity and subjectivity so it's not Oedipal and but it, it's not anti Oedipus either the matrixel is not here and not there. Okay. It's about the several, severalities. For, for purpose of time, Andrew, this has been really nice thread. I think you've hit and questions have emerged after Andrew's intervention. One of them I think can be answered fairly quickly perhaps, and it is the following. I'll just read it to you. Um, is the matrixial logically prior to the phallic or just chronologically prior? And if, um, is there something like a matrixial explanation for the appearance of the phallic order? I know that's actually a hard question, but maybe uh, you could, for purpose. I of would time. say I would say it like that: that uh, if we take the the trans connectivity 
of, uh, on the level of uh, fantasy, on the level even of trauma. Um, imagine for that, uh, the very late pregnancy, for example, where some senses are already functioning, where if the baby is born, it will be alive. So it's not symbiotic, it doesn't need the maternal uh, to live. If we, we think about ways of sensing the cell, I and non-I in, in a very pre-subjective pre ways, starting from that, I would say that the, the already we can see different uh, dimension uh, quite earlier. If it would be developmental, it is before any phallic possibility even exists. We are not in symbiosis and then formulated ourselves through rejection, but we are transconnecting and getting all kinds of senses. You know, there, is a, there was a moment where, when, um, I know that in neurosciences, people spoke now uh, some years ago, but the mirror and so on, there are activities in one mind that penetrate another mind, and we have to imagine goods. I call strings these direct, real vibration, and I call threads the already more conceptual or more meaningful, uh, at, you know, attentivity to these uh, strings. So it, it is um, logical to assume priority that the primordial situation is is not multiple but it's several, it is two at least, could be in principle three or four or five. It couldn't be in principle one, and it couldn't be in principle endless fragmentation. The matrixial does cannot come from that. It is another dimension. And in my formulation, no doubt the, the what is later called, called the phallic develops and is a is stronger. Mm -hmm. Matrixial continues all our life, but it remains more fragile. Mm. It remains more vulnerable. It collapses under extreme stressful situation when, when the, you know, the human animal goes to itself. And I also would say that we can come in contact with it only if we fragilize ourselves and, and, and let a bit melt the boundaries which relates only to here is my body, you know, my body in the mirror stage. To start to recognize also in order to put yourself in a relation to the vulnerability of somebody else you need to self-fragilize yourself and lose a bit of your control, of your power, of your... This is, for artists, it's, um, for me as an artist, as a painter, it's very um, natural to enter a situation where I'm not identifying. But in that way, in that way also we can think about society, about the way that we are inspiring one another or that I could transform that which is traumatic to you and you cannot talk about it, but I have to do it in a certain creative way and compassionate way and all kind of concept that enter it. Because if I'm in the mood of rejecting and establishing the phallic, uh, my phallic position, of necessity, I will not be able to connect to this more fragile matrixiality that is all the time all this time just as well, in my view, a part of us. So we can, I could, I would not say that this brings uh, birth to the phallic, that this is first. And I would say that it is there continuing all the time, always. And surely this, the meaning of that is that we have to re-understand, understand in a different way, this, the phallic structure itself that we built in order to explain our human life. Okay, Dimitra, would you go? Uh, try to stay yes. uh, quickly if possible. 
Oh, yes, okay, thank you. Hello, Braha. Uh, hi, thank you for, hi, hi. It's been so long. Thank you for the great talk. Um, it was very, very interesting, everything on the gaze. And I was thinking, you mentioned in passing um, that the voice is also a very interesting partial object. And if you could just, you know, quickly just give us some hints. Yeah. <clears throat> If we start from uh, if we start from Lacan, um, I can find the reference for you. You can find it also. The model uh, of the voice was the the shofar. Shofar is that instrument that looks like this from the corn of this animal, and the shofar is uh, is like a cry, like a like music, it penetrates. And what penetrates is the voice beyond the words. We might be talking, but there is all this, uh, let's call it the mus musicality of our voice, which is the invisible, the un unarticulated of our talking with one another. So there is that shofar, there is this uh, musicality and the tonality and of that voice, which is a part, you cannot separate it from the words that are addressed to you, but you can in your mind separate it. So he starts with that shofar, with that instrument in order to uh, explain to us the same thing that need to be understood when we talk about the gaze and the eye. The gaze is not what I see, right? And so the voice is not exactly what I hear, the words that I hear. And in terms, if we start from the matrixial, then uh, the emphasis will be on that, on resonance. And imagine that situation when each one of us in this encounter eventing listen to the same voice, some of us utter the voice, some of us only hear the voice, and therefore some of us also speak and hear the, while I speak, I hear my voice. While you speak, you hear your voice, you also hear, I also hear your voice. So there is this transmission, where is it, this voice? Who does it belong to, you know? So you have the one and the other, and each um, partial subject, let's call it like that, uh, absorbs the voice in a way which is already relating to its own field and to the relations and to the resonance we all encounter. And then on the phallic level, which one of us will take it to a very different place, but we can again reabsorb it and use it in a more uh, matrixial way. And so the voice, I remember in, my, in the in very early work, when I wrote about the matrixial gaze, I wrote about the touch, voice and touch, the touching gaze, which is not symbiotic gaze, the touching gaze, the touching voice. The, and then you have kinesthesia, and then you have it is not only, uh, if I even take it to the question of uh, Wilfried, um, it is not only how I relate to one another, to, to my environment, and it is also how I relate to, to the river, to the water. If I can listen to the trees, and then am I allowed to speak for the trees, and why, and how? So we have to remember there's the metaphor of the, of the voice, but there is the real of the voice. There is the trace of the real of the voice. There is the loss of the voice. And in, in the later seminars of Lacan, there is a lot of emphasis on what you hear when, you, when I speak to you, what you hear from that which is said and so on. The say, that which is said is not what we are talking about because it is the fact that we are saying and the voice and all the affect that accompanies is 
is blurred through the meaning which we give, which would be then phallic meaning. And that's not negative, not positive. It is a definition of the moment where we cut it from the rest of it. And therefore poetry would, would not be, would, would be more matrixial. Um, well, the poetry that I like to read, it, it can go to true, true movement in the same time. It must keep its music. Um, thank you, Dimitra. Okay, Mark. And then I know others have commented, maybe I would invite you to speak if you wish. I know Jameson has had a question and Frank and others, but let's start with Mark and please try to keep it brief because we're already at two hours. So I want okay, to- Okay, yeah, I'll just uh, brief. Go uh, ahead. Sorry, one second. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It was really, really interesting. I'll get a short comment and then a short question. So your work is a great device to explain our place in, in the crisis we are currently in with screen capitalism and digitally mediated reactive politics and its opposite. Obviously, we have the hyper-nationalist reconstruction of the phallic father. However, we also see massively creative spaces where the name of the father is collapsed in and given language game groups and whatnot, but this has not led to a state of mass psychosis. It's given over to something else, a proliferation of new potentialities and subjectivities and ultimately progressive politics. I think in some cases, we see the failing of Lacanian analysis to give full expression regarding these new modalities of subjectivity, since it attempts to locate these in the field of sexuation, neuroses, psychoses, perversion, etc. What I'm interested in is the type of enjoyment that keeps people engaged in such digitally mediated politics. In that sense, can we talk of a third term of jouissance regarding your work? We have phallic jouissance, other jouissance, but does matriaxality focus on something else, another kind of jouissance, one that allows non-relation and relation at the same time? That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I suppose it's a remark. It's not really a question, right, Mark? It's, um, it's a remark, and it's important to say that um, the, the, the question of to what an extent psychoanalysis um, can account for society and for uh, politics, and it's a very, very, of course, old, old question. And it's an ongoing question. And also the question whether we can take, how, how do we understand the collectivity? How do we understand the mass? How do, do we understand ourselves as subject versus society? Or do we understand ourselves as subject resulting from society? It, it, it's obvious for me that, that, uh, um, that Lacan achieved few major steps of development and then, then we have to move to move it on, on all different levels, including and majorly the social level, finally, and political level. The questions still remain, what kind of relationalities and break from relationalities we can imagine based on what we uh, understand as the human subjectivity because doubtless the human human being achieved so much power that they can also destroy the earth and they might also help to to make the earth flourish so it's not because the human being is better than any other kind of living being on on earth but it is because of this capacity also to destroy that we must pay attention to, to, to these uh, domains of the mentality and the, the psychology, our psychological capacity. And what is it that allows us to connect or be fascinated by this uh, political figure or, or another? What, uh, what are the what are the values that underlie it? In the matrixial sphere, for example, the value, we didn't even start to talk about it, 
there are implications that that uh, to care and carry are uh, are important values. So if you decide this is a value, then it also enter the question of what is social value, what we value, what we you know, and the question of why why money is more important than care or you know I put it very bluntly. But of course I agree with you that we couldn't stay there. We couldn't even stay with the very, very late Lacan. We have a question from Anna. Thank you, Thank you Mark. That was a beautiful testimony question comment. Um, Anna asks, I'm going to read it. Can you speak and have you thought about how in the matrixial anxiety um, is different than in the way Lacan thinks about it vis-a-vis -vis the phallic order and the symbolic order? Could you speak about anxiety briefly? Um. Yeah, I, I, I would say that if uh, any of you would like to read more about the question of anxiety in my work, I can send you papers and you can give it to Anna and to those who are interested. Um, spontaneously, I will only say one thing, that for Freud, the only primordial affect is anxiety. When I'm thinking in terms of the matrixial and where it is not possible to, to put subject and object exactly in that same compositions, um, I realize uh, that there are other primordial affects that very easily enter the affect, become anxiety, but a priori they have not been anxiety, but they are prim primary affect. And so we can dedicate, <laughs> we can dedicate a whole uh, chapter to that. But um, yes, there is a paper called, I think it's easy to get it on the uh, internet, uh, Uncanny O, Uncanny uh, Compassion, Uncanny O. Um, so what is this passion, which is com passion, and how can it translate itself to anxiety and, and so on. I want to invite uh, Frank to say a brief question and uh, Leslie, if you want to go Frank and then Leslie, you can follow just to preserve time. Cause I'd like to get, we may not get to all of the questions today but I think next week we will be able to. Go ahead, Frank. Uh, thank you, Braca. Very wonderful uh, scintillating conversation. Um, I, I feel like my question is somewhat moot. Uh, if not, it's just a little bit retrograde back to the idea of how to position uh, matrixality um, and, and the phallic object. And I'm curious if I'm, if I understand it correctly, uh, it's the encounter of Das Ding that precipitates or catalyzes, um, you know, the transformation of Das Ding into the object A. And the object A does not really represent the subject as a signifier for another subject being represented by a signifier, but represents something else of a different dimension. I wonder if the object A then represents constitutive elements of the dusting and therefore what we're talking about is that both phallus and matrix are constitutive elements not in relation with each other so well perhaps fraughtly but that's secondary but does object a uh, reflect uh matrix <clears throat> the matrix and the phallus as elements of dusting um I took that a bit one step further in, in um, also in few articles that I can send you or refer you to, because what I was asking us to do is to allow for a certain differentiation already in the notion of the dusting itself. Yes, yeah. So that what we have is not just that the dust thing, you know, translate into the lacking object, that its only appearance would be the on, our only way to attach it in a sense, which is, which is also relating to our mind and capacity to capture it, will not only be 
as one possibility that then refracts itself. But imagine that the dusk ding itself had been already structured in a cell, like a certain bubble, which is undifferentiated. And to introduce the differentiation in there, it's very difficult conceptually. And that's why I needed to go to the, to go deeply and understand what is it that uh, serves our great masters like Freud and Lacan and even, and even Heidegger and even before to um, understand what would be a life drive. Thank you. Because it's as, as near to how we understand life drive as possible. Okay, so in, in my, um, in that way, the, of course we, I, I took then the structure of the object A and, and built what would be a matrixial object A, object A, and how they will negotiate and how they can also capture one another. And at the end of the day, we could look at the phallus matrixially. That wouldn't, it's not a contradiction for me because it's another dimension. Which means that we have, for example, understanding even of masculinity, femininity, and so on in the phallic field. And we have another understanding of, of uh, maleness, femaleness, everything in the matrixial. And then they, of course, negotiate because in the matrixial sphere, by definition, you cannot just separate it entirely. That's why I said to you, imagine for a moment, instead of saying, okay, object, subject, object, and so on, in continuity and flip sides, imagine that this one must be within this one in order to, you know, you see the structure? That's um, a kind of, um, I didn't really put it mathematically, but that's probably. Um, apology. I thought apology. Well, I painted it. <laughs> I, think, I think we'll do our, our final question um for for today so that uh, folks can um enjoy their sundays uh barbara has asked thank you braca for this time today i have a question having to fragilize oneself to contact the matrixial as you mentioned uh, art working can assist um if art working is done in a communal way how does that impact the fragilizing experience? Is it more fragilizing or is it less fragilizing to do art in a collective way? Or is it kind of both? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, there is a book that came up recently of a... Um, and there's a lot of uh, artists uh, there talking or analyzing matrixially the artwork. And also there is a group of uh, people who are trying to work uh, art in that way. But I would say that in any encounter, there is, a, there is a certain risk. There is a certain opening that we might, we have to take. And it's a huge question. If, if, um, if we say that already somehow our um, cultural sphere and our political universe is, I defined it many times in many phenomena, it's like a, the neutral became paranoiac. So there is, paranoia is generalized. And what could have been just paranoia, you know, uh, we, suspect, we, suspe we are suspicious, we cannot work with one another, we worry about our ego and so, it became neutral, it became the neutrality of the situation is, it's transparent, but it's a bit paranoiac. Like we, we feel that in order to trust, we have to break, um, go out of ourselves. But yeah, it is self-agilizing because it challenges our capacity to trust. And it's a question of awareness. Um, working in a, in a group, uh, is one way in the in the universe of art there is this uh, interest 
subjective relational um, phenomena, but it's not necessarily that this interrelation doesn't necessarily mean that we can enter the matrixial sphere. We might even be more afraid or, but to be aware of it is, means that we can take a, more risks and then forget ourselves. And so there are a lot of uh, groups that work together in performance and so on that, that I could see that these matrixial um, possibilities are very alive there. I think it's, it's an interesting um, way in terms of artists working. On the other hand, and even paradoxically, um, I came to understand all, uh, all that I'm talking about from my relation to painting, which is a very long meditative process. And, you, and I'm alone, you know, so, so when I'm alone, I can feel also and come out with all this. And I realize even from distance, all these connectivities and how it works and how we can work with. And it takes uh, with the painting itself, it takes this self-fragilization. And it's not, a, if we look in the modern art, if we go into museums and we see how, you know, the bigger, the better, more huge, more immersive, more, you know, fa fantastic uh, is equated with size and so on. We, we realize that we live in a certain, under certain assumption of what is more in, you know, there's no relation between intensity and size of uh, of a work, you know. So for me, a lot was uh, is understood in my work in my studio. But I think that um, to work in a group is you could exercise in reality and see where it takes you, and. Yeah, we have to understand that the matrix is not a kind of a paradise. There are other anxieties, there are risks. There are, um, we risk things that we are not used to think that, uh, you know, we became very suspicious of any uh, trust, you know? Uh, so can we rethink trust? In the matrixial lab, we rethink fascination. Fascination is not fast, just a fascinum that everything is, you know, the leader is going to control you. Fascination is first thing a baby needs, you know, to get more life in, 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 in the move. So we probably threw the, our baby side with the water, you know. Uh, we, the, there are many things that uh, the, the society filtered and psychoanalysis produced a universe and it, we have to, to change that. Uh, well, um, I want to, on behalf of everyone um, here, thank you for this generous and just um, just very penetrating experience to, to be a part of this a moment with you. So we're very honored and grateful to say the least. Um, and I wanted to ask if you have an, an idea for any things we ought to read over the course of the next seven days until we meet again um, for next week, is there anything that you would recommend? And you can send it to me and I can share it too. Um... Or if you want to think about it, you can also kind of send me. No, in. I, 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 I was thinking that a, a very early paper from 92, which is the matrixial gaze, can give a good start or I will send you. And um, surely the question of anxiety, right? And um, it's really up to you. Can you say a word on what you, we expect uh, for next week? Is it ever uh, people will do their own presentations or how does it work? Or do I you think, want me I to think, um, something? No, I think actually for the, 
for the presentations, we would do a third session. The, the, uh, the fact is um, you're able to join us. So I think we would want to take advantage of your presence and allow you to um, maybe leave more time for, for this question experience, but to continue a kind of lecture, okay? Um, and maybe yeah, these two, you know, kind of picking up really on these questions that have been raised okay. would, would be natural enough, I think, to, 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 to do. Um, and I would also say I can um, encourage everyone to write out their thoughts, their questions. Maybe that would formulate uh, a response paper by our third session. Um, we are growing, huh? <laughs> we are materially growing, web upon web, like that. Wonderful. It's my pleasure. I really thank you and for all the questions and we'll move on. Any, any of you have this book that um, maybe we will need to uh, scan at the first chapter? Do anybody has this one? Mm -hmm. We do. Uh, so perhaps well, I'll tell you, perhaps Wales can, or I will, if I find it, one chapter from this one. Okay. And, uh, and I'll give you more material in relation to your questions. And we will move deeper into the matrixial sphere and to how it can be revealed in the processes of uh, analysis and what we do with what would be the principles of working. Fabulous. Again, on behalf of all of us, um, thank you so much. We're very, very pleased. So, thank you very much. Well, and we'll see you in one week. Okay, thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.